Hey yeah, welcome back to another video. Thank you for joining me today. As always, I hope you're keeping well. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in February and March. I didn't read that many books in February and I feel like I've been putting up too many reading wrap ups recently and I think you're just going to be like over encumbered with the amount of thoughts that I've been having on books that I've been reading. So I decided to combine the two months. Also, I feel like this video is going to be a bit negative, a bit ranty because to be perfectly honest, there hasn't been any sort of standout stellar books that I've read so far this year. And unfortunately in this video, there's some of the lower rated books that I've read so far. So yeah, we're gonna get a bit opinionated in this video. Let's get into the first book that I read in February. And that book was Thornhedge by T. Kingfisher. This is the first time I've read any fantasy from this author as I've only read their horror works previously. And I decided this is a short little book. I might as well just test the waters and see what their fantasy writing style is like. And I enjoyed it for what it was. This follows Toadling who has been put in charge of looking after a tower that contains a sleeping princess. But the princess isn't what she seems to be. You know, she's there enchanted in a blissful slumber with a nice little smile on her face, looking like butter wouldn't melt. But it turns out she isn't exactly what she appears to be. And Toadling needs to protect the locals and any sort of prince or knight who may come to wake the princess. She's been looking after this tower for about 200 years. Her magic abilities that she can as you guessed, can turn into a toad at a moment's notice. And the story kind of jumps around in different time periods. So you've got Toadling in the present day looking after the tower and then it jumps back to um, Toadling's life about 200 years previously. I did enjoy it for what it was, but I feel like it was so short and so brief that I wasn't able to get an accurate idea of T. Kingfisher's fantasy writing style. So I will probably have to read some of their longer form works uh, in the future. If you're someone who's into cozy fantasy, this is definitely one to check out. The next book I picked up was The Salt Grows Heavy by Cassandra Kaur. So I had seen reviews of this. I thought the reviews were quite interesting in the fact that they were criticizing the prose within this and that a lot of people struggled with the writing style and the use of language in it primarily. So I thought I'd give it a go. I'm really glad I did because had I not picked it up based on those reasons, I feel like I probably wouldn't have picked it up at all. So the story is about a mermaid who's captured by a prince and she ends up having to marry the prince and he's incredibly abusive. He ends up like ripping out all her teeth so she can't harm him. And it's just not a pleasant relationship. And they end up having children and the children luckily take after their mother and they end up destroying the kingdom, reducing it down to ashes. And this mermaid is like, well, what am I going to do with my life now? Because I have nowhere to go, nothing to do. I've lost my sense of purpose. She also cannot speak and it very much leans into the tale of the Little Mermaid, but it just makes it so much worse. So this mermaid meets up with a plague doctor that she's already familiar with and the two of them go out on a journey and they come across this small town inhabited solely by small children. And the children seem very violent, they have a lot of bloodlust, they like fighting with each other and they're just a bit feral. But the two quickly realise that these children aren't alone. They're actually being taken care of by these three people referred to as the saints. It's a very cult-like mentality that these children have. There were moments in this book that really surprised me by how dark and disturbing they were. I was really impressed by Cassandra Kaur's writing style. I was really impressed by her prose. There are some moments that are just so poetic, so beautifully written, and the relationship between the plague doctor and the mermaid is just so heartwarming to witness, especially knowing the history of the mermaid and knowing all the abuse and trauma that she's gone through. I just really enjoyed watching the character development happen within this. I really enjoyed the story. I think the pacing was great. And if you're stuck looking for something short and sweet that is gonna be quite thought provoking at times, definitely check this out. Then I got a book out from the library. I picked up The Premonition by Banana Yoshimoto. So this is about a 19 year old girl who's grown up in a fairly decent middle-class family. She gets on really well with them, but she's always had this sense that something from her past isn't quite right. She's always had this feeling that she's forgotten something incredibly important from her childhood. And this is really her journey in order to figure out what that one thing is. And she occasionally takes breaks from living in her family home to live with her sister. And her sister is someone who really doesn't seem to have everything figured out in her life. So this was a really slow, domestic, family dynamic type of novel. 
and I actually really enjoyed it. I enjoyed that it felt like I was taking a little bit of a break with reading it. I could read it at my own pace and because the story gives you little breadcrumbs it felt like I was continuously still invested throughout the entirety of the story and I felt like it had a great resolve to it as well. I'd say if you're someone who's into like Japanese translations or you just like that kind of like family dynamic storylines this is definitely one that's interesting. The next book I picked up was also a library borrow and it has to be one of my most disappointing reads of the year so far. It was Mayfly by CJ Lead. So I'd seen people really hype this book up in reading vlogs, in their reviews of it. Some people even said it was like quite extreme horror. It is not extreme horror, not in the least. I have to say that I found this novel just incredibly boring for the most part. And let me tell you why. This book follows Maeve, our main character. She lives in LA, she lives with her grandmother and she is her grandmother's main caregiver. Although there are nurses coming in and out of the house every other day, her grandmother is in the final stages of life. And basically Maeve finds out from one of the nurses who comes in that this is probably gonna be the week that she's going to lose her. She also works in a theme park as a princess and you can tell which type of princess she's meant to be. She loves this job and she does it with her best friend and the two of them just get on really, really well despite the fact that pretty much everyone else who works at the theme park hates them and thinks they're weird. So going into this novel and knowing the setup to it and knowing based on the blurbs on the back of the book says that serial killing isn't an all boys club anymore. So we know that Maeve is gonna eventually start killing people. And the thing that really grinded my gears the most about this book is that the fact that we're waiting and waiting and waiting for something interesting to happen. You know, we have the setup of Maeve's everyday life. We know what she gets up to, this and that. We kind of have the vibe of her as a character. Um, but when it gets to her first kill, you know, finally, the thing that we've been waiting for, the thing that we've been told, like, this is, this is going to be extreme, you know, it cuts away to like the next day. And I was just like, wait, 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 what happened to your one? You know, your one that you just bashed over the head, what happened to her? Maybe because it was really just marketed and sold to me by other reviewers that this was going to be like an extreme horror novel. I was expecting a lot of blood and guts and gore. Um, I was expecting really interesting kills to happen within it. And I was just so let down by it. And I was really giving people side eye then after reading it, being like, what did you see in this? I didn't think it was all that great. I didn't think the kills were all that interesting. Well, you know, the aspect of them that we actually ended up seeing. The ultimate relationship that ends up happening within the book, I felt was lacklustre and I didn't particularly feel anything important for Maeve as a character. Unfortunately, I just felt like it was really not a worthwhile read for me and I was really pissed off that I'd kind of wasted my time with it. Like American Psycho, you are not. And there were moments in it where it really was trying to ape some of the uh, inner monologues that Patrick Bateman had. And I was just like, no, no, I'd rather just read American Psycho again. You know what I mean? If you're looking for something that has a lot of bloodlust in it, that has a lot of gore, interesting kills, this is definitely not the book. Now to continue on with my complaining and ranting, the next book that I read, again, another library borrow, thank God that I didn't waste my money on this, was Rouge by Mona Awad. Now I had seen people in the run up to me reading it, unhauling it, um, giving it negative reviews. And I thought that was quite interesting because Bunny had such a chokehold on so many people on booktube and booktalk. Bunny definitely has like a serious cult following. And as someone who read it, I didn't really understand it, but I was like, okay, you know, you do you. Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna trash you or try to understand it. I'm clearly out of the age range for it or I'm clearly not the target audience for it. So I decided, you know, I'll give Rouge a go. So this is about Belle, whose mother has passed away. She's passed away under really mysterious circumstances. And Belle is basically left in a load of debt. She is left to pick up the pieces. She moves into her mother's home and she's trying to settle her mother's estate. She's trying to figure out how she's gonna come up with all this money that her mum had just spent in the last couple of months leading up to her death. And she starts to figure out the picture of what was happening in her mother's life that was causing her to need to spend so much money. And it begins and ends with skincare. And this is something that both mother and daughter had in common where they were both obsessed with skincare and learning about new products that can give them that eternal youthful look. Belle starts to suspect that maybe this love of skincare and this quest for youthfulness 
that her mother was so consumed by was what had led her to her mysterious death. So like I understood what Mona Ward was trying to say within this book but I just don't think her writing style agrees with me all that much. I can't really vibe with that hallucinogenic style of writing where you can't tell like what is real and what's not real and the thing is what was most frustrating about it is like these were the moments of horror that were happening within the novel and I just had such a hard time understanding what was happening. To me it felt like a bit of a cop-out for writing instead of writing a detailed scene of what was happening to Belle, writing this as like a dream sort of sequence where we don't know what's real or what's not. It just fell flat for me to be perfectly honest and I can understand why people really didn't vibe with it but it's interesting that people who enjoyed Bunny also didn't necessarily enjoy Rouge um, because I feel like they're there's very similar storytelling elements to them. Again, this is another book that I rated quite low. I think I gave it about two stars and I feel like I was being quite generous with that. I really did struggle with it. I really did want to just put it down because I didn't feel like it was necessarily worthwhile continuing with it. And by the time I did finish it, I was like, I should have just put it down because I am none the wiser after reading that book. Then to get into books that I read in March, which I did read more in March. However, the quality of the works that I was reading didn't necessarily improve. So firstly, we have Piercing by Ryu Murakami. This is a book that had been on my radar for quite a long time. I read Audition and I read In the Miso Soup several years ago now, and I found this in chapters and decided, do you know what? It's finally time. So this is about a man who has a newborn baby and he has insomnia, which obviously you don't necessarily want to have insomnia when you have a newborn baby but he spends his nights standing over the crib, staring at the baby, and he fantasizes about using an ice pick on the baby. And it is so horrible to think that like your protector can also be the person to take your life away. So initially going into this, I was just on edge being like, I really hope he doesn't kill his own baby. Instead of killing his child and ruining his marriage, he decides to take out these vengeful violent acts on a sex worker because, you know, Occam's razor, right? He decides to pick out a sex worker and organize her to come to a hotel room. He makes several like rookie mistakes by like using his real name and all that sort of stuff. So there is a bit of paranoia on his behalf based on how sloppy he's been when he thinks that he has everything down. And unfortunately for him, he picked the wrong sex worker to mess with. Again, this is another one that was quite a short read. It was around 180 pages or so. Um, I got through it pretty quickly. There wasn't as much disturbing things in it as I had hoped for, especially based on the premise that we're given before going into the book. I think at this point, realistically, Audition is my favourite Ryu Murakami book just because it was so brutal. But this was okay. It was fine for what it was. It was an entertaining read. You know, it, it it kept me interested in it throughout the whole thing. I was interested to see what these two characters would get up to in the end, in their like final showdown and stuff. But I felt like I just wanted a little bit more. Next, I read Goddess of Filth by V. Castro. This again is another little novella. It was a strong two months for reading novellas. This is about five young girls who are all set to... um part ways and end up going to college in a few months time and as one of their last hurrahs they decide to have a seance inspired by the craft. The seance doesn't go well. Initially it's all fun and games but one of the girls seems to take it a little bit too seriously and she starts rolling around on the ground and having these convulsions and ends up speaking in an ancient Aztec language that there is no possibility that she knows how to speak. So naturally, all the other girls are horrified, they're terrified, they don't know what to do. The possessed girl's mother ends up blaming them for what has happened to her daughter and she stops them from seeing her. So there's a long time period where the girls don't know what's happening with their friend and the mother gets a local priest involved and he feels like she's possessed by a demon. But the girls, based on knowing what they went through together that night, have a feeling that there's something much more ancient within their friend. I love the possession genre. Like, I feel like I can just read any possession novel and I'll enjoy it for what it is because the concept of possession is so creepy to me. But I feel like this did a really interesting take on it. If anything, it was kind of like a story of um, growing up and acceptance and all that sort of thing. So I was really impressed by this. 
I was really glad that um, it lived up to my expectations of it for once. If you're interested in possession horror, this is definitely one to check out. The next book that I read was another library borrow. It was YN by Esther Yi. I don't remember how this book actually got on my radar, but I ended up adding it to my to read list at some point last year. It has quite a low rating on Goodreads, but after reading it, I think I can understand why. So this is about a Korean American woman who's living in Berlin. She has a flatmate and her flatmate's really into a K-pop band. And she tries one evening to get her to go to one of their concerts. And our main character is like, no, I really don't want to go. It's really not my type of thing. Like, I'm not interested. I'm not going to have a good time. But ultimately, she ends up going. And when she does go, she has this kind of like revolutionary experience and she ends up becoming obsessed with one of the boy band members who is referred to as Moon. Anything to do with him, she's looking it up online. She ends up reading uh, fan fiction, which is where the name of the title comes from. UN meaning your name. I actually wasn't familiar with that because I'm not a fan fiction person. So I was like, huh, you learn something new every day. So she starts kind of writing fan fiction about what she thinks her life with Moon would be. And they're very mundane. They're, they're, they're not these like over the top romantic fantasies. They're just like everyday sort of interactions that they might have with each other. And she ends up becoming so consumed by Moon that she ends up going to Korea in hopes to find him because what ends up happening is that he's just removed from the group one day. So she goes to Korea in hopes to be able to meet him, to be able to find out what happened to him, and to see if her idea of him actually lives up to the reality. So there were some moments within this book that were quite poignant, and there were also other moments that were very on the nose. There was like one particular scene where a character is saying like, I just, I don't understand why you'd want to meet Moon, because it's never going to be better than what it is in your head. And I think that could be said for a lot of things that us as humans experience within our life. But yeah, I found this a really entertaining read. I thought the moral of the story and the topics that were discussed in it were very interesting. I would say if you're someone who's interested in K-pop or you're interested in fan fiction, this probably isn't the book for you because it seems like most of the reviews on Goodreads are slating how the author dealt with the fan fiction side of things or then how she went about the theme of obsession with the k-pop side of things. As someone who is a complete blank slate going into this, I think that's probably why I ended up enjoying it so much. I gave it four stars. I really enjoyed the prose and the style of writing. It was quite a slow read but still one that I felt that I had to keep going back to. And even when I wasn't reading it, I was thinking about reading it or I was thinking about the story so far and where the story itself was going to go. So I felt like I was really engaged with the work. A really positive reading experience for myself anyway. The next book that I read was You Mean the Nightmare Painter by Brandon Sanderson. So this is the first time I ever read anything by Brandon Sanderson. I purposely picked out a book that was going to be a standalone because Lord knows I don't need any more series to start or to be in the middle of. So I specifically was like, okay, we'll go with this one. I'd seen positive reviews of this. This is also probably one of the highest rated books that I have on my own Goodreads. So I figured, you know what, if, if all the Brandon Sanderson fans are saying that this is fantastic, they're rating it a 4.5 on Goodreads, it's got to be good, right? Right? So this story has two main characters. We have Yumi, who is in a world of light and brightness and daylight and that's very much her aura and her personality too. She is a worker of the people. She basically goes around from village to village in order to help the local people there by summoning spirits and getting the spirits to help the people. And then we have our other character, Painter. He lives in a world of darkness. There's no such thing as daylight from where he lives. And what he does for a living is that he is a professional painter, but he's a nightmare painter. So in his world, nightmares are real things that walk around and feed on people. So in order to banish the nightmare or to at least disable it for the time being, he paints something. And it's not that he paints the nightmare itself. He paints something, usually bamboo, and there is a whole heap of other nightmare painters. And there's like this dream squad that go out and tackle the particularly nasty nightmares. 
the ones that are basically manifesting into real life things and that can be a real danger to people. And what ends up happening is the two end up body swapping in some weird way. When Yumi wakes up one day, it's Painter that's in her body and she's able to communicate with him and talk to him and see him, but everyone else sees him as her. And she basically has to give him instructions on how to live as she is living and vice versa. He said he was very inspired by Final Fantasy with this book, but he was also wanting to write about two characters who just had normal everyday jobs, but was set in like a fantasy type world. And I have to say, when it comes to fantasy, this was very, very low stakes. I suppose there was fantasy elements there with like the spirits and the nightmares and stuff but there was no sense of urgency. Every time we were getting close to having an action scene with these nightmares, very quickly the rug would be pulled out from underneath us and like nothing would happen and nothing would really come from it. So I was left feeling incredibly unsatisfied from it, but unfortunately it really didn't do much for me because I wasn't engaged in the story. I didn't find the characters to be interesting. It took me about a month to read this and it's only about 300 pages or so but it became my in-between book. So every time I finished a novel and I didn't really know what to pick up next, I'd read 50 pages of this and then I'd just go back to picking out a book that I actually wanted to read. That shows like how I really wasn't engaging well with it. I'm really surprised at how high of a rating it had and it goes to show that people's love for Brandon Sanderson's writing is probably the most important thing because I don't think a lot of people were really reviewing this in a serious critical sort of way because I just I just thought it was kind of boring to be honest everyone's just gonna say well you should have started with this you should have started with that it's like yeah but like come on I just want a standalone you know just to test the waters if I can even recap this by the end of the year I will be impressed by that, to be perfectly honest. The last library book that I read in March was They by Kay Dick. This is a book that I periodically will pick up whenever I'm in Hodges and Figgis and I will just look at it. I don't believe there's much of a blurb on it, but I have seen it pop up in people's reviews over the last couple of years and I've always been very curious about it. Now, it is a dystopian tale and it's, again, a very short read. I believe it's just under 100 pages or so. I love dystopian stories like I don't care what brand of dystopian it is but I usually just it's just a genre that's always a hit for me for the most part. So basically in this dystopian world it's set in Sussex in England and it's basically about these mysterious creatures that are referred to as they. Primarily focuses on the artists and the critical thinkers and anyone who has any sort of artistic element to their job they're the ones that have been severely affected by this because they don't like art. So you have like the National Gallery has been raided and works of art are just being destroyed. And what's interesting about this is that like it's very much like the less you know, the more creepy it is because I have no idea what they look like. I have no idea why they don't like art. For those who are the creatives within this world, they are basically cultural refugees because they have nowhere to go and nothing to do and they basically just live in their memories of what they used to do and how life used to be like. And what I really liked about this book is not only just how subtle everything is and, you know, it really leaves a lot up to the mind of the reader. And it obviously goes to show that it's like, well, our characters in this, you know, they can't be creative anymore. They can't be thinking about the same things that I'm thinking about when I'm reading it. And I thought that that was a really interesting parallel. But also I loved the setting. The setting is just this beautiful sort of coastal countryside vibe, very cosy, very much something that the characters in this would be very inspired by. It's not like a desolate post-apocalyptic world. It's still very beautiful. And there's still a lot of what people would take inspiration from, from the past still there, but they're just not able to act on it, unfortunately. There is just such a subtle eeriness to this that I absolutely adored. And I feel like it's definitely one that I'll be rereading in the future because it goes by so quickly. I feel like it would be very valued as a reread to pick up on more things that I didn't necessarily notice the first time around. 
So yeah, if you're into subtle dystopian creepy tales, this is definitely one to look out for. The final horror book that I read in March was They All Died Screaming by Christopher Triana. Despite the fact that this is an extreme horror novel, I found it incredibly entertaining, incredibly funny at times, and I felt like the horror was really well executed and I ended up giving it four stars. So we have two storylines that are happening within this and they don't really make sense up until the end. The main storyline is the fact that a virus has broken out and it turns you into a screamer. So basically you get incredibly violent and you scream and scream and scream until you die. So screamers will attack other screamers, but they'll also attack humans. And there's no idea of how the virus actually spreads, whether it's airborne, whether it's through touch or through saliva or blood. So our main character in this is Chuck and he's kind of like the leader of the group that ends up getting together after this virus has gotten out. Chuck is a heavy drinker. He regularly loses his job or gets fired from his job because of his drinking problems. He only works shitty minimum wage jobs. He doesn't have much of a life. He's very kind of misogynistic. Um, there's a particular moment where he's just looking at a young girl out his window and he's just thinking all these like really gross, disgusting thoughts. He is not a typical hero savior type person, but he's been forced into this position based on the happenings in the world. And then we have the second storyline, which is about a young boy who gets kidnapped after wandering away from his mother in a shopping center. And he's kidnapped by this like gross old man who brings him back to his pig farm. He has no idea how to get home. He has no idea why this man wants him there. And the old man I mentally refer to as the jackal because that's how the boy describes his smile because he's missing so many teeth. But this old man is gross. He's like really into his pigs, if you get my drift. The two storylines worked really well together. I was just as interested in both stories. I was really interested to how they were gonna link together in the end. I feel like it actually did have genuine horror moments within it when it comes to the virus, when it comes to the screamers, when it comes to like the really high stakes, the fact that we don't know how the virus spreads and stuff like that is one of my favorite subgenres of horror is like viruses and apocalyptic style sort of tales. And I'm so happy that I enjoyed it. And I definitely want to check out uh, Christopher Triana's other books because they're also meant to be fantastic and leave you a hollowed out husk of a human being, which is pretty much what I want from my reading, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. And then finally, the last book that I read in March, which was my in-between book between reading these extreme horror novels, which I don't think I necessarily made a great choice on the book that I decided was going to be my in-between book, but I read I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy. So I had been meaning to read this for quite some time. Obviously, it was really hyped up when it came out because of truth bombs that Jeanette dropped in this about working at Nickelodeon and what her life was like with her mother and just all the abuse that she experienced as a child actor. And then with the documentary Quiet On Set coming out, it was all brought back up on my TikTok feed. I decided this was the time to finally read it. This follows Jeanette's life from quite early in her childhood when she starts acting. And it's very much a story of her and her codependent mother and how abusive and manipulative her mother was and how she basically saw Jeanette as an extension of herself in order to fulfill her own dreams. Like she wanted to be an actress, but never got around to it. So she forced Jeanette into acting. And it's really sad seeing from such a young age, Jeanette having to learn how to respond to her mother in moments when her mum is going to like flip out on her and stuff. I understood the tone of the novel because obviously Jeanette is still struggling with the issues that she raised in this. She still struggles with her disordered eating that unfortunately her mother passed down to her in order to encourage her to act and to get roles. And it very much is focused on the disordered eating. So if you're anyone who's had an ED or anything like this, just know that before getting into this. What was really disturbing about it is like Jeanette would be talking about something mundane and then she'd drop some sort of awful like truth bomb about something that her mother did to her. She's obviously a person who ha still has a lot to work on herself, that these are issues that are going to continue to come up for her. Um, in her day-to-day -day life, but I found that the tone of the writing was very kind of matter-of-fact and there wasn't really a sense of personality to her writing. It was just very much like this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And because it's a celebrity memoir, she didn't necessarily have to carve out a kind of voice or personality within it, 
but I just felt that the writing was very flat and um, I have more of a sense of what she doesn't like versus like her as an actual person or understanding her personality. A few mixed views on this when I was reading it. Obviously it's a horrifying story and it really does open your eyes to what goes on to with child acting. It's unimaginable thinking that you could force a little child to do this and then live off the money that they earn and just force them to become the breadwinner of the family at such a young age and put all this pressure on them and stuff. I feel like I still have a lot to think about when it comes to this book. If you are curious about this book just be aware that there are a lot of darker topics that are brought up in this that aren't necessarily discussed because obviously everyone focuses on the Nickelodeon aspect to it where there's much darker things that are happening within her life um, than that unfortunately. So those are all the books that I read in February and March. As you can see it was a very up and down reading period unfortunately. I'm hoping that April is going to be much better. I'm hoping that I'll read my first five star book of the year, fingers crossed. I feel like so far this year it's just really been slim pickings. So yeah if you've read any of these books and you have any opinions on them let me know below or if you have any recommendations for me also let me know because I can always get it out of the library because I'm still on my book buying ban. I am three months into it now so halfway so we're, we're going good and if you want to see more content like this in the future feel free to like and subscribe it really helps the channel out and it gives me a good indication of the content that you like and the content that you don't necessarily like so if you want to keep up with me outside of youtube you can always follow me on my tiktok and my instagram where i post other bookish content that i don't necessarily share on youtube and as always i hope you enjoy this video and i will talk to you soon goodbye